Hello everyone, welcome to Valen Digital. Today we are going to discuss about a phenomena known as electromagnetic induction. So when it was discovered, there is some kind of phenomena called electromagnetic induction. It was a tremendous, a humongous discovery because at that point of time, the concepts of electricity, magnetism and combination of both were not yet discovered much or were not much uh, went into detail or explored much. So at that point of time, when we knew that there is something called electromagnetic induction, there are many ways which are much more simpler and economical in order to produce electricity, it became a huge hit amongst the scientists. So today we are going to study about the basic laws of this electromagnetic induction which was given by Faraday, known as Faraday's laws of induction. So it is not just only Faraday who gave these laws or it was not just Faraday who discovered these things, parallelly there were many other scientists also who were uh, continuously performing experiments in order to discover something which was relating your magnetism and electricity or something which was giving you more of a convenient way to produce electricity. So let's first start with a few experiments that Faraday under, uh, undertook and he performed certain experiments which led to this discovery. So the first one was that he took a simple coil and he took a bar magnet. What is a bar magnet? A bar magnet has two poles, one is north pole, one is south pole. So what he did was he took a coil, a simple coil. This is a coil which is uh, formed of conducting wire or conducting material it is formed of. In this he just connected a small galvanometer. He did not connect any kind of power source, he did not connect any kind of battery. So technically at that point of time what was uh, already known was that if you connect a battery there should be some electricity flowing. If you are not connecting any kind of power source, there should not be any electricity flowing. So technically, if you are taking a coil, simple coil connecting a galvanometer, there should not be any current flowing in the circuit, no matter what happens outside. That was at that point of time which was known to the scientists or known to the people. So here what he did was he took a coil, he took a galvanometer in front of which a bar magnet was kept. What he did was he started moving this bar magnet towards and away from the coil. So what was seen was that there is some kind of deflection shown in the galvanometer as a consequence of flow of current. Why? Because galvanometer's function is what? It will show you if there is any current passes through it, it will give you a deflection and more is the current passing through it, more deflection will be shown. So two things were observed here in the first experiment. Whenever he was moving bar magnet towards or away from the coil, there was a deflection, first thing. Second thing, whenever he was changing the speed of this bar magnet, it was seen that the deflection was also varying. When he was speeding it up, deflection was more. When he was uh, slowing down the speed, speed, what was happening? The deflection was going down, which means that whatever is the amount of current produced in the circuit was varying with the speed. That is more speed means more velocity. More velocity means more amount of current was being produced. So this was just the first set of observation which was found. So which indicates that there is some kind of current flowing in the circuit without any kind of power source. So this was one of the experiment which he performed. So what was the conclusion of this experiment? Conclusion of this experiment was that it was observed in this experiment of Faraday that the galvanometer shows deflection only when the magnet was in motion and not when it was stationary. So at a point when he kept the bar magnet stationary, there was no current observed. But while speeding up and down, there were deflections in the current which was going up and down. Similarly, the deflection is small or large depending on the speed at which the motion takes place. So these were the two observations which were made in the first experiment. So what he thought was that there is some relation of current with the motion of the magnet. So it led him to go to the next experiment and he performed the second experiment. But in this case, instead of a magnet, he took two coils. Again here also, the first coil, the primary coil here is again only connected to galvanometer. The second coil that he took was having a power source attached to it. So what he did was he switched on that circuit. After switching the circuit on, current is flowing in the circuit. Then he started moving this coil, this is known as the secondary coil, towards the primary coil and away from the primary coil. So again what was seen? It was seen that there is some kind of deflection shown in the galvanometer. 
it means there is some kind of current in the galvanometer. Similarly, here also he changed the speed or relative speed of the secondary coil with respect to primary coil. Again, it was seen that there is some kind of current, sometimes larger deflection, sometimes smaller deflection, which again shows that there is some kind of relationship between the whatever is the aura, whatever is the magnetism produced by it, whatever is the speed of this body, whatever is the speed of this power source and coil which is connected to it with respect to the primary coil. So, the conclusion that he got from here was that the degree to which the reflection takes place depends on the motion of the secondary coil towards the primary coil. The magnitude also depends on the speed in which it was moved. And then this shows that how the second case is analogous to the first. So, the first and the second case almost were related. Why? Because in the first case, whatever was observed, same was observed here also. Whether it is related to the speed or it is related to the current or the reflection produced in the galvanometer. So, he got an idea that next let us perform an experiment where I do not move the source coil itself. So, in the third experiment that he performed, what he did was again he took two coils. But in this case, the second coil or we call it as a secondary coil again is connected to a power source but the only difference is now the secondary coil will not move. In fact, it is attached to a switch so that we can switch it on and switch it off. So, let us see what was the observation. So, initially when he switched on the circuit, there was current flowing. When the current was flowing, there was some kind of current which was observed after a certain point of time when the current became constant in the circuit. At that point, no current was again seen. Again, he switched off the circuit by pulling off the switch. Again, he was looking at the current. There was some current, there was some kind of deflection which was shown in the galvanometer. So, what he uh, concluded from here is whenever he was switching on and off the circuit, only for a fraction of seconds for some amount of time, there was increase or decrease of the current because of course, instantaneously your current will not go to the maximum value or will not come to 0. There would be some fractional amount of time which it is going to take to build to a maximum value or to come to 0. So, for that much amount of time current in the circuit was varying and only for that much amount of time the current was observed in the primary coil also. As soon as the current in the circuit becomes constant, no longer you could observe the current in the primary coil. So, from here what he understood was that in the first two cases he was relating everything to speed, but when it came to third case he understood that not just relative speed, it is depending upon some other thing. Basically, it depends upon the variability of current in the circuit. By variability of the current, what did he mean? He meant the variability in the, in the magnetic field lines which are passing through the primary coil. So, what happened here, how he explained the things was that he told that it was observed that the relative motion is not necessary to produce the current. The button in the battery when pushed the galvanometer deflects. So, relative speed was not a necessity to get an induced current or a current in the primary coil. But what was necessary? The necessary thing was that whenever you were changing the flux through the primary coil, here if you see in the first two cases also, when speed was increasing or decreasing or whenever the magnet or the coil was coming towards the primary coil uh, or uh, going away from the primary coil, it was not the speed which was causing your current. The quantity which was causing your current was the amount of field lines which was passing through your primary coil. Exactly is happening here also. So, the conclusion that he gave from this whole experiment, three sets of experiment was that whenever magnetic flux changes through the coil with respect to time, an induced EMF is produced in it. And if the coil is a conducting coil and a closed circuit or a closed coil, there would always be an induced current also which is produced in it. So, it is not that always current will be produced. But EMF definitely will be induced whether it is a conducting material, non-conducting material, straight material or any kind of material. Induced EMF would definitely be there, but current will only flow the, through the circuit or uh, whatever material you have kept in the changing flux region if and only if the material which is kept is a closed loop or second thing it is made up of conducting wire. So, this was the major observation of electromagnetic induction and this is nothing but electromagnetic induction that whenever you change magnetic flux through a closed loop, you will see that there is an induced EMF which is produced across the conductor and as a consequence of induced EMF, we know that wherever potential difference is there, we will also get EMF. 
same happens here also so that's what happened here so what are the major ch challenges or major uh, factors which are basically going to govern the change in flux we know that flux is nothing but what phi is equal to b a cos theta so the first quantity which we can change in order to change flux is what nothing but your magnetic field the next quantity that you can change in order to change your magnetic flux is what nothing but the area of the coil and the last factor is theta and what is this theta theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the area vector so whenever any one of these three quantities changes across any given coil whether source is attached to it or not there would be an induced emf and hence an induced current if the loop that you are considering of course it is a closed one and second thing it is made up of a conducting material now what was the statement of faraday so all these three experiments led to certain laws of electromagnetic induction the first law gives the definition of your electromagnetic induction and what is that it states that whenever a conductor is placed in a region of varying magnetic flux an electromotive force is produced what is electromagnetic force nothing but a potential difference this is the basic definition of electromagnetic induction and also the first law of faraday second law of faraday it basically gives the magnitude of the induced emf which is produced so let's see what that is so what he told is it states that the induced emf in a coil is equal to the rate of change of flux why because whenever the speed was increasing induced current was also increasing which means that more induced emf is getting produced whenever the flux is changing at a better rate so more is the rate of change of flux more would be the induced emf and hence more more would be the induced current so mathematically i can write induced emf's magnitude only please remember faraday's second law gives only magnitude not the direction direction was given by another scientist that we'll come to so magnitude of e is directly proportional to d phi by dt if you remove this proportionality sign you'll get a constant dimensionally the value of the constant comes out to be 1 so the magnitude of flux induced comes out to be d phi by dt if you want to look at the unit of this uh, emf it is nothing but voltage itself next coming on to a few important points about electromagnetic induction the first thing emf is induced in any coil irrespective of the material so whether it is a conducting material or a non conducting material emf it always be induced but that is not the case with current current will only be induced if your material is made up of a conducting uh, material and always of course if it is a closed loop so if you are having whether you are having a metal ring or you are having a wooden ring or if you are having a plastic ring in all these cases all these materials induced emf can be formed but when it comes to current if a coil is conducting then only current is induced in the coil last point about electromagnetic induction just now we have seen emf's magnitude is given by d phi divided by dt so you can always apply it anywhere unit of emf remains same as that of potential difference that is nothing but your volt so this was all about what is the basic definition of electromagnetic induction what is the magnitude of emf which is induced the last part of electromagnetic induction is the direction of induced current it was given by lenz by lenz's law so what is this lenz's law let's look at it gives you first of all the direction of induced current and what does it say it says that the direction of induced current is always in such a way that it opposes the reason by which it is produced and what is the reason by which it is produced change in flux so whatever is the nature of your change in flux it would be opposing it so if you are writing the entire equation of emf an additional negative sign you'll get because it is changing the rate of change of flux right so you'll get an additional negative sign here that denotes the opposition to the change in flux so in general what happens in lenz's law is see whatever induced current is produced in any circuit it is in such a way that the induced current will produce a magnetic field or a magnetic flux which opposes the change let's say there is a flux which is increasing through the coil then the induced current will try to reduce that flux by inducing a current in such a direction which produces a magnetic field or magnetic flux opposite to it second thing if the flux through the coil is reducing external flux then it cannot increase it because it is not having its own source the only thing it can do is it can support that flux so that's what happens even in lenz's law 
right? So let's have a look at a few points about Lenz's law. The first and the major point is that Lenz's law is the consequence of conservation of energy. The consequence of conservation of energy, why we are saying it like this, that would be discussing in the coming lectures. But right now, the main important point about Lenz's law is that it follows the conservation law of energy. Now, based on the points that we have studied here, the few points we have already discussed, let's solve one or two examples. The first example, we are going to draw the direction of induced current in this case. So, let's have a look. First of all, this is, if nothing is specified, you can consider it like a metal ring, maybe. Here it is not specified, but by default, we are taking it as a metal ring. It's a closed ring, metal ring, induced current can be formed, first thing. Second thing here, magnitude, the variation of magnitude of magnetic field and the direction is already given to us. Dot means what? Out of the board. Cross means what? Into the board. That is the direction, the convention of direction we have been using. So, here they are saying magnetic field in which this ring is kept is out of the board and the magnetic field is increasing. If magnetic field increases, what about flux? Flux is BA cos theta. If B increases, flux also increases. If flux increases, whatever induced current is generated in this must reduce this flux. To reduce this flux, in which direction magnetic field will be produced by induced current? Opposite to the magnetic field which is external. So, in uh, what is the magnetic field produced by this ring? It should be inwards. If it is inwards, what is the direction of induced current? Use right hand thumb rule. Thumb is in the direction of your magnetic field that is cross. Therefore, curl your fingers right or you can also call it as a clockwise direction is the direction of induced current here. Same goes with another case. If you see in this case, there is a cross. Cross means magnetic field is into the board, but it is again increasing. So, this is the external field. So, whatever flux is produced and this is also increasing because magnetic field is increasing, but it is increasing in the inward direction. Since it is increasing in the inward direction, whatever current it is producing must reduce this flux or magnetic field. So, in which direction it will produce the flux or magnetic field? Opposite direction. Opposite means outwards. Call your fingers, use right hand thumb rule. The direction of current becomes anti-clockwise. So, just two steps you have to follow everywhere. First, check the direction of magnetic field. Second, check the nature of change in flux by checking either magnetic field or area or angle between the uh, magnetic field and your area of uh, area vector of the coil which is given. So, just check these two things. Once you check it, then you go for right hand thumb rule by opposing the magnetic flux. Let us move on to another example. In the next example, if you see, again we are given with two coils. First coil we are taking here. Here also dot, outward is the magnetic field, but the nature of magnetic field is reducing. So, flux also reduces. If flux reduces, it cannot increase it, right? It can only support it. So, induced current will produce a magnetic flux or field. In fact, here field in the direction of the same as that of the external field so that it supports it. It cannot increase it. So, it will support this one. In order to support, magnetic field must be produced in the same dot direction. Dot means outwards. Thumb outwards, curl your fingers. When you curl your fingers, in which direction current is going to go? Anti-clockwise direction. This is the direction of induced current in this case. The last case if you check, in this case, into the board is magnetic field here, but it is reducing. So again, since it is reducing, according to Lenz's law, the induced current must support it. How will it support? By producing magnetic field in the same direction as cross. So cross, call your fingers, direction would be nothing but clockwise direction. So, this is how you are going to find out the directions of uh, induced current in any kind of coil. But please remember any case you are getting to find the direction of current, you must check whether it is made up of a conducting material first thing, second whether it is a closed loop or not. If both the conditions are satisfied then only go for the finding of directions otherwise if it is a wooden ring directly you can put it, put the value of current as zero. There is no kind of current which will flow through a wooden ring or plastic ring or any non-conducting ring. So, just be careful of that. Otherwise, this is all about electromagnetic induction. Basic definition was given by Faraday. And the second thing, magnitude of EMF induced also given by Faraday. Third thing, direction was given by Lenz's law. How to find the direction and the basic definitions we have already covered. 
So, in the uh, next lecture, we can also study about all the other few problems which can be done regarding these. Thank you all of you. Have a good day.